Mic check, one, two, one, two. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar-chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. Sells. All right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. This is Bob Bender, and you're listening to this edition of the business side of music. In the studio with us today, Chuck Thompson. Chuck, I've known for, we're going to say about 10 years or so, (laughs) something along those lines. He has been in the business almost as long as I have, and yet he's so much younger looking than me. Uh, 35 (laughs) years plus in the industry. Uh, Actually got into it while you were attending Belmont. I did, yes. That's kind of cool in itself because that's such an amazing program. And continues to be. Yeah. Ever growing. Uh, you posted, uh, or you saw a posting for an internship, caught your eye, and wound up uh, working for uh, a publicist, Woody Bowles. I did. And going down the list of some of the artists you worked with, some of the people that I truly admire, David Allen Cole, uh, Frizzell and West, Ricky Skaggs, the Flying Burrito Brothers, and George Strait. You are old. Indeed. At least with the Flying Burrito <laughs> Brothers. Well, the Fine Burrito Brothers were one of Woody Bowles' clients. When he, I started working with him when he had just gone out on his own. He was with Columbia prior okay. to that, was their, their head of publicity. And that group of people, actually, that you just named off, with plus a couple, were his, the clients that he took with him when he opened his agency. How long ago was that? That would have been 1979. And then moving fast forward a little bit, having worked with the Judds, Billy Dean, McBride and the Ride, Pirates of the Mississippi, great guys, Carl Perkins, Skip Ewing, Winona. You then, fast forward in 1995, you accepted the position of Director, Media Relations, and Artist Development with the newly organized RCA label group in Nashville. How did you get all that on a business card? (laughs) Front and back. Yeah, front and back. Mm -hmm. Just kind of scrolled around. So you worked with such artists as Kenny Chesney, Lone Star, Minnie McCready. Uh, You also worked with the label's NASCAR efforts, which is kind of cool because I'm a big NASCAR fan. Uh, 97, you returned to the ranks of artist management, working with Danny Lee, uh, who I absolutely love. And a couple of the other artists, one that you and I met together on, Eric Durance, mm-hmm. Pear, Ricochet, who was one of, uh, been around for a while and has done a great job, Michelle Wright, who you're still working with, Tom Shepard, Brownsville Station, Wings of Apollo, uh, Maiden Dixie, Mutual Groove, and uh, among others. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. So you're a man of many hats. Let's just say that. First of all, you're a manager. That's what I know you of. But... You also now have your fingers in the water, or maybe I should say you have your toes in the water with Navigator Records. I do. And I've come to the conclusion over the years that to really be successful in the business part of this of business, it's important to at least have a working knowledge of how every piece fits together. Um, when I got my first job, was with publicity, and then we partnered with a gentleman named Ken Stiltz who had his own independent label, Dimension Records. Right. It was the Billboard label of the year for a number of years. So I started early in finding out those pieces. If we move forward now, Navigator Records is an outgrowth of our management company because the business has come to the point where there's a great division between what a major regular label can and should do for you and the services that are needed for an artist to be successful, whether it's on the front end of that career or the back end of that career. So we need to find a way to let them access that world as well. So we've created Navigator Records 
to fold into that piece. And I think you've said something vitally important that we all have to realize at some point in our career, you're on the front side of it or you're on the back side of it. You don't always stay at the top forever. I think I think a few have or have been close to it. I think George Strait is a prime example. Absolutely. I think Kenny Chesney and Tim McGraw are, are definitely there. Faith Hill, Reva McIntyre. Uh, they've not really kind of settled. They're, they're still big stars that can play at least in the country music scene, that can, that can play big dates. Uh, I think The Who is a good example, The Rolling Stones, some of those. The majority of the artists, it is kind of an up-and-down thing, and maybe more than once. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a matter of, you know, you have to learn to adapt. And that's one of the things that's really happened in this business is it's changed so dramatically. When I went to work for the first record label, we were selling CDs, and CDs almost don't exist now. It's a lot of streaming. So you have to have a different business philosophy. What have you seen? We've, not only have we seen the methods by which people get music change, but we've seen, as you just said, the theory by what we use music for. And it really depends on where you are in your career. Sometimes for an artist, music is, and putting out new music is important not just because of the content of the music itself, but it's, it becomes that marketing piece. It becomes the ability to create the conversation. Right. We're working on a project with an artist right now who had not put out new music in five years. So we went back in and started cutting new music and, and realized that it was something that we needed to let the public hear. So we went very old school with her. We started putting the music in the shows before it was available to create that demand, and now we're releasing uh, singles. We're releasing an A and a B-side single through Navigator Records for her fans to get the music instead of waiting for a full album. Is that a download or a stream? Or? Well, it start, <laughs> interesting on that evolution as well. It started out to be a download and a stream project, but we've now taken that to the point where uh, we are pressing actual CD singles and selling it at her merch table. Just like the old days. There you go. Yeah, something we did 20 years ago. Yeah. And it's become uh, not only a, an ability to, to play to an older audience, but it, it's become her signing piece. It, it's now outstripping her 8x10s as what people can buy to have her sign. We talk about that so much on the show. The, the physical piece that the, the customer... The, the patron that goes to the show, the concert goer, they can hold something in their hands and then be able to have the opportunity to go to the table, <clears throat> to be able to go to the table and have the artist sign it. It's an emotional purchase, and we talk about that a lot. I can see how that would sell at least just as well as the poster or the 8x10 or the T-shirt. So it seems to be working. It, it actually is, in some markets, outstripping the other things. It's selling better than the posters or the tees and uh, you know keychain just the, the standard merch items this artist has a catalog of about 15 albums uh, in a lot of markets of course the price point on that is is lower considerably lower than a full cd right so it's outstripping some of her catalog product as well what does a cd single go for we sell it for five yeah yeah and you know once again it's that emotional purchase and, it, and it's it's a nice piece of revenue for the artist out there especially if they own the song they're the the creator of it or the co-creator it's something them to own she, uh, on these two particular songs she was not a writer or a co-writer on either but yes we own the masters so we control all of that and the songwriters have got to appreciate it too mm -hmm. more so than a stream these days yes where do you see the future of the record label we're going to kind of bounce around here a little bit but the record label, that model isn't what it used to be. Not even close anymore. No, it's not. And, and in my opinion, it's a function of radio. Uh, not all artists need a, a full-line record label. Again, in my opinion, it's defined on what artists are actually viable at radio because record labels, and, and rightfully so, they maintain those relationships. They maintain that that gateway to get on yeah. to those 120 top ADI markets. They're kind of the key masters. They are. Yeah. They are. And it's the difference between an artist at one level and an artist at a Kenny Chesney level. So I, I see that continuing. What I'm also seeing, though, is... They're taking less chances. I mean, when I was at RCA Records, we were spending 
a considerable amount of money to break an artist and you know it didn't necessarily have to be successful because the law of averages would went out over the top the margins are so much less now that you've got to have a great record and a hit first time out or you probably won't have a second the numbers we looked at back then you know we were anywhere from low to mid five figures when we took a song to radio is it anywhere close to that now i I honestly don't know the answer to that i have not had a song or an artist that has been at major market radio in about five years so i don't don't know that i can speak to that Uh, in the studio with us today uh, chuck thompson manager and label head in the studio today and you're listening to this edition of the business side of music hi this is martina mcbride happy holidays from our house to yours you're listening to the business side of music hi this is vinnie rebus the founder of indie connect Our goal is to ensure that you have the knowledge, the tools, skills, resources, and connections that you need to develop a profitable and long-lasting career in music. One way we do this is through these Business Side of Music podcasts. I'd also like to invite you to check out Indie Connect magazine, our free multimedia online publication packed with practical interviews and advice from music industry experts. Go to www.indieconnectmag.com. That's www.indieconnectmag.com. Let us walk with you and guide you every step of your musical journey. You're listening to the business side of music. We're back in the studio with Chuck Thompson, head of Thompson Entertainment Group and Navigator Records here in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, before we took the break, we talked a little bit about radio, obviously the record label's position on that, and there's still obviously the key masters or maybe the gatekeepers, whatever label we want to assign them. Is radio, as you and I know it, is it still as viable? And, and maybe this is a two-part question. If you're signed to a major label, I guess it is still viable because they can get you on billboard. Is it still as viable for an independent artist or are there other routes that we can go? Well, yes, I, I, th- I think you just hit on the key point. It's whether or not you are signed to a major label or not. When I go out and, and start to book a, a show for an act, on what, regardless of the level that they are at, the first question I always get asked is, do they have a song on radio or are they going to have a song on radio? And this is coming from the buyers. This is coming from the buyer, the concert buyer, yeah. yes. And, and conversely, when these buyers uh, go out and, and start to book an act, they're looking for these acts that they feel like are going to be on radio at the time of their show, especially the, you know, the fair and festival buyers. They know that being on the top ADI radio, that's free advertising for them, as it you know should be as a part of their... Right. Uh, you know, their calculations. So in that sense, yes, that record label is still a viable place and radio is still a very viable uh, direction for those artists. Over and above that, it, it's sort of a six of one half dozen the other. I mean, it's great to have your songs on radio and it can create more value, but there are so many other ways to get your product and your name out there anymore that if you're not in those mainline stations whether or not radio is going to help you is, is questionable. Right. And whether it's it's affordable. Well, that, and that's another great point, because what we're also now seeing as well, be, with radio stations, their profit margins being cut, there was a time where you had a publicist on staff that could go out and set up radio interviews when you were going into a marketplace. We're being told on, in some situations that unless that buyer or that concert promoter is already buying a schedule on that radio station, they're not going to set an interview with your artist because they feel like that's just giving away free airtime. Yeah, exactly. I want to transcend into something else that this is a conversation that came up years ago uh, when I was at the label. One of our artists at that time, young guy, had had some hits, uh, but was, I guess, let's say he was kind of on the backside of his career. And he was talking to different managers and he couldn't find really a manager that fit his wheelhouse finally had the conversation with him and that was you really have to have something to manage in order to have a manager what is the manager's role today i think i think you have to answer that in 
relevance to where that artist is. But your point is exactly right. You have to have something to manage before you need before you need or should engage a manager. That manager can open doors for you, and it can, it can help you start to develop your career path. But what is it that you have to manage before you even go and, and seek out that guidance, seek out that person in your team? And, and that question can very well be different for every artist. You can't. It, just, it's it's not a cut and paste. No, no, it can't be. And and that's a good point as well because. If you go in there and sit down and the first thing out of that manager's mouth is, I can do this and this and this, and you should do this and this, your ears should perk up a little bit because you should look at a management relationship as a long-term relationship. Uh, You mentioned George Strait and Irv Irv Woolsey, his manager. They've been together since the very beginning. When I worked with George, uh, they had just met and Irv was still at the record label. That's the kind of success and kind of longevity and relationship with your manager that you should strive to have. Yeah, and I think that that really translates into to anything, whether you're selling a product. Uh, you know, I'm a NASCAR fan. People who listen to the show know that. You know, Jimmy Johnson and Jack Knauss went through seven championships together, been together, you know, numerous years. Uh, it is developing those relationships and, and maintaining it. Does the manager take on a different responsibility these days is it what is it that the manager what is the hat or the hats that they're wearing now Uh, obviously the manager is always looking for the best deal for the artist whether it's a record deal or or a a booking agency or a publicist but you're also kind of a you're also a friend and a mentor and and a handhold on occasions too more than just occasions yes i I mean i think you should look at your manager as your quarterback they take all of these pieces that are flowing in and and try to help find the, the place that they fit or the places they don't fit and develop that long-term game plan for you as the artist so that as your career does have the rise and fall that's natural with it, that you're prepared for those steps. Do you think that the artist that is out there touring on their own, maybe not necessarily has a record deal per se, uh, but they're out there and they're, they're working hard. Should they be looking for a manager to take them to the next level? Does that make sense? You know, if they're a self-sustaining entity at this point? I think you should always, as an artist, look to add to your team. You can't do everything at all levels for 24 hours a day. You're going to need to bring in a manager or a booking agent or a publicist. And they're just essential parts of their business. What they can do for you and the ready contacts that they will bring to the table, simply take that workload off of you. Because as any artist that's out there knows, creating music is one part, but there are so many other parts that have to be accomplished. So if for no other reason than taking that workload off of you to allow you to create and, and put on the best shows and do the interviews, that should be something that you're consistently looking for. For every artist, though, finding that person and putting that person in place at the right time is a different answer. And it's a fit. It has to Mm -hmm. be a certain fit. You know, the manager and the artist have to be able to get along because you're not only dealing with someone's career, you're dealing with their lives. Yes. And so that should be important that when you're out there looking for someone, uh, that that relationship goes beyond just the music. And you hear horror stories in this business every day about managers who either don't do what they should have done or do something that is in, not in the best interest of the artist, you have to be able to trust that person and to know that they're doing what they can do. And it's not to say that we're not going to make mistakes, but what they should do in the best interest of your career so that you don't have to sit on the table and, and watch what they do every day. Let them do what they do. Uh, you've hit on a, on a key point there, and that is we're all human. We all make mistakes. And I said this earlier, if there was a cookie cutter template or we had that crystal ball, we would use it, but we don't. I, I remember at the label when we signed our one artist and ultimately was multi-platinum, almost every other record label in town was looking for that same, it, it, we called them hat acts. You know, you'd take the hat and slide the artist under. It didn't matter whether the the artist fit, or I'm sorry, it didn't matter whether the hat fit the artist, it was whether the artist fit the hat. We can't operate that way, at least not anymore, because the, the numbers have crunched down so much that we have to be real careful what we do. And so it's not so much maybe making mistakes as it's a learning experience for everybody. Absolutely. Our business is changing every day. I mean, we go from the impact of radio to the different distribution channels 
to the way people are consuming music. It's a learning experience, and then you have to be constantly aware of those changes. And, and as I said earlier, you've got, you've got to be looking farther down the road to try to anticipate where you need to be career-wise or where your artist needs to be career-wise a year from now. And that's almost a conversation you have to have from the beginning, I would assume. Where do you see your career at certain steps? Is that something that you find as you're talking to new artists that they they have that in their head or is it something you have to kind of pull out of them? It, it's interesting. I, I've had I've worked with artists who have a great sense of themselves and have enough of an understanding to know what that direction is and where they're going to be. I, I've sat with artists who understand that there's a direction, but they don't quite know what that direction is or where it is going to be. And unfortunately, I've sat there with artists who have said, I'll just do whatever you tell me to, just tell me where to go. Is that healthy? That is a scary, yeah. scary situation to be in. I would think so. We're going to take a, another break, and when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about the management role versus the agency role, because obviously during one of our breaks, we were talking about how that's changing dramatically too. In the studio with us today, Chuck Thompson, head of Thompson Entertainment Group and Navigator Records. We're talking about managers and their roles today here in the music industry, and you're listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Jeff Carson, wishing you and yours a happy holiday season. And remember, please don't drink and drive. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Wow, I just joined the Music Starts Here community. This is a truly hidden gem for anyone in the music business. Whether you live in Nashville or anywhere else in the world, Music Starts Here is like a GPS for your music career. This is the place to be if you want to get advice and direction from some seriously talented musical people who have been where you want to go. Music news, events, and a great big community with resources for artists, songwriters, musicians, studio and tech, along with music business advice from pros in the industry, all on one site. Make sure you get your free profile now. Go to www.musicstartshere.org. That's musicstartshere.org. You're listening to the business side of music. We're back in the studio. You're listening to this edition of the business side of music. With, uh, with us in the studio today, Chuck Thompson with Thompson Entertainment Group and Navigator Records. Manager extraordinaire, I will say. Wow. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I saw you do some things when, when you and I first started working together. I thought you, you were working with what I thought was one of the coolest artists and songwriters, and that was Eric Durant. Just one of those guys that had that natural ability to, to write a good song and, and get out there and perform. And still does. Yeah. Uh, Eric's living in Florida now and, and still writes and still plays every weekend. And has had some success. Yes. You know, Eight Second Ride with Jake Owen did really well. I'm glad to see that. Do you, when you see an artist for the first time, do you have a sense of whether they've got a certain amount of what we call the it factor? I can, I, I like to say that I can see the spark. I don't always, There, there's a very famous artist in this town that I saw early on and thought they would never make it and now they're selling out stadiums. Oh, and but we'll, we've all done that. That's not original. Well, yeah. Yeah. But it, it, to me, it, it takes, uh, I, I like to get to know people first, uh, simply because of that long-term relationship that I try to develop with artists. Yeah. But to me, it takes a little while to figure out what that is. The role of the manager versus the agent. I mean, this is a conversation we have quite often with different artists that we speak to. Obviously, the manager's role is one thing. The, the agent's role is another thing. The agency has changed so much now. It's not the boutique operations that you and I are used to. You know, we were just talking about Buddy Lee Attractions uh, finally closing their doors, and, and, you know, Bobby Roberts just got absorbed into UTA. Where do you see the manager working with agencies now? Has that changed a lot? I, I don't think that that relationship has changed. I, I do see the interaction has changed. I, I mean, in the past, I've worked with, as you said, the boutique agencies where I'm on the phone every day with my responsible agent and, and we're working on this project or working on that project. The larger agencies, I find, as with most of the business, the interaction is a bit more electronic. These bigger agencies, the, 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 the extra value to me is that not only do they have people on their staffs that are able to help you bring concert dates 
to the table. But you know they'll have a literary division if your artist wants to, to publish a book, or they have a television division to help get us on Letterman, and, and so that whole or maybe in a of, film as as a bit or actor or whatever. Yeah. Yes, and you know some have music placement agencies in, uh, attached. So my my songwriter clients suddenly have that access to, to film and television that they didn't have before. So that part has changed dramatically. For years, if we wanted all those services, we usually had to go to two or three different agencies. So it's all become more in-house. It has. It yeah. Has. Do you think that, well, maybe, maybe this is a, let me approach the question from this point. Do you think that the artist that is out there, well, first of all, is the record deal as viable as it used to be for an artist? from a management perspective? At a certain point in your career, it is. I, I think what has changed, besides just the actual structure of the deal itself, is that it's becoming much more of an important issue to understand and to know when it's time to approach a record label. Do you think the same falls into place for the artist with the agency? You know, one of the biggest things I hear from artists all the time is, I need to find an agent to book me. For whatever reason, they they're either don't know how to book themselves or they're afraid to book themselves. But most agencies aren't really interested in a, in a young independent artist. No, and, and from an agency standpoint, you have to understand, they're, paying, they're a percentage player. They take X number of percent of what you book. If you're going in and playing dates for $500, it's not going to even pay an agency's bills to book you. Uh, so, yes, getting an agent on board, in my opinion, is probably one of the first people that you should look to add to your team. But you have to understand that you have to develop yourself to the point where it makes financial yeah, sense it's viable for them to, do to so. them. Right. Yeah. Where do you see the role of the manager? Because that's obviously changed too. Where do you see that role in the next? two to five years? I, I think we're going to see it actually strengthen because a lot, in the past probably 10 years, I've seen a lot of the management roles fall to, to attorneys. Uh, they're, you know, negotiating contracts. They're, they're doing the things that, that managers, when I first got in the business, did and now more so. So I, I think we're going to see a management role become a bit more critical, but just like with the agency, it's, it's finding that having that artist to put themselves in a position where they need that management and can help fund that. And not by saying pay, you don't pay a manager. They're a percentage player as well, but that manager has got to be able to make money. That's something that we need to really make clear that it is a percentage deal for the manager too. So it's got to make sense for the manager also. Now, as a part of that too, I find from my sense, the artists that I work with, we're spreading, especially when we first start working with a lot of these artists, we're spreading ourselves a little thinner. We're making the publicity calls or we're talking to the buyers, things that, you know, as an artist moves into a certain level, the manager doesn't necessarily do on a daily basis. It's all those different hats that we talk about. Right. Yeah. And that's something that the artist needs to understand. It does become almost a 24-7 relationship at that point. Oh, it does. Yeah. I, I still get calls at three in the morning when a promoter doesn't pay an artist right. Or I, I, I fortunately have a, a wife who is incredibly understanding that there's a cell phone on my hip 24 hours a day. Yeah. I, I remember those days. I actually don't miss them. <laughs> <laughs> How can people find you? Um, we are uh, at uh, thompsonentertainmentgroup.com. That's the easiest way. We're based here in Nashville, and we're in the book. Navigator Records. Navigator Records the same way. Navigator Records is a wholly owned division, of, and, and currently we are using it specifically for the artists that we manage. to That give are signed them that, to your roster. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we develop Navigator Records to give them that extra leg up, to give them that peace. Uh, we're not going to be RCA records, nor do we intend to be. Probably don't need to be. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't mind having a yeah. little of that budget going yeah, around. No. But we we know that our artists need that kind of attention. So we, like we were talking about sort of stretching these other hats, that is an area of our firm that we've developed to help give them that leg up. Chuck, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. This is Bob Bender, and you're listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. As a listener, you know that the Business Side of Music podcast is free. But in order to keep it running, consider becoming a patron of our show. You can do this by going to our Patreon page on our website, which is www.businesssideofmusic.com, and click on Support the Podcast button. 
When you become a patron of our podcast, you'll have access to material that you won't be hearing on our regular shows, insight from industry leaders that is designed for our patron members, and have the ability to purchase the business side of music merchandise that you can find on our website at a discount. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. Co-producer for the show is Vinny Rebus. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Los Angeles, California and Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Fusine.